This podcast and the following message are brought to you by Smart Pixel. Turn your website's anonymous visitors into engaged customers. Smart Pixel turns your anonymous website visitors into fully identified first party consumer data. When this match and identification takes place, Smart Pixel can return up to 300 attributes on the consumer. You get name, postal address, email, gender, and date of birth, plus more specific details like home ownership, vehicle ownership, political party affiliation, presence of children in the household, and many more. Smart Pixel, real-time information about your website visitors, easy to install, and fully GDPR and CCPA compliant. Find out more by going to autoconverse.com forward slash smart pixel. That's www.autoconverse.com forward slash S-M-A-R-T-P-I-X-L. And thank you. The trust in, in media and newspapers and television is you know, hitting an all-time low. People don't trust us. They don't believe us. And it makes me wonder if this job, as I'm currently doing it, is effective uh, but if it's doing more harm than good. That was MSNBC anchor Katie Turr reacting to America's lack of confidence in the media. A new Gallup poll shows it is hitting an all-time low with only a tiny fraction indicating that they trust what they read, watch, or listen to. In fact, 16% of people surveyed said they trust newspapers and only 11% trusting television news. As an example, just this week, The View a daily news program that runs on ABC News but is hosted by ideological entertainers such as Joy Behar and Whoopi Goldberg, found itself apologizing on the air to Turning Point USA. So basically, a war of words broke out after the conservative group was rallying the next generation of voters at its youth summit in its Tampa location this past weekend, and the liberal panel just could not help themselves. Joy Behar, a comedian, accused the conservative organization of harboring Nazis or something like that. Have a listen. This Turning Point conference, the Nazis were in the front of turning out there in front of the conference uh, with anti-Semitic um, slurs and, um, you know, the Nazi swastika. Mm-hmm. I think it's important that every single person that attended that Turning Point, every Republican speak up yeah. against the swastikas, against yeah, the disgusting. Nazi uh, flags that were waved. You let them in. President, open your you let them in and you knew what they were. Right. So you are complicit. I want to make a quick clarification about the neo-Nazis at the Turning point event they were outside protesters my point was more metaphorical that you, you embrace them at your thing i felt now lawyers for turning point immediately sent disney which owns abc news a cease and desist letter threatening a lawsuit and as a result the view took a moment to apologize on the air right before a commercial break On Monday, we talked about the fact that there were openly neo-Nazi demonstrators outside the Florida Student Action Summit of the Turning Point USA group. We want to make clear that these demonstrators were gathered outside the event and that they were not invited or endorsed by Turning Point USA. A Turning Point USA spokesman said the group, quote, 100% condemns those ideologies and said Turning Point USA security tried to remove the neo-Nazis from the area but could not because they were on public property. Also, Turning Point USA wanted to clarify, uh, wanted us to clarify that this was a Turning Point USA summit and not a Republican Party event. So we apologize for anything we said that may have been unclear on these points. So what does all this have to do with today's episode? Well, as journalistic integrity continues to deteriorate among mainstream corporate media, which is only amplified by big tech and social media, it means that independent media sources, such as this podcast, which are not trying to manipulate your mind, may have a lot more to offer than just news and analysis. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. From Autoburst Media, this is Autoconverse. Hey, we got a good show lined up for you today. Oh, well, I'm a Game of Thrones nut, so that's, that's, that's my jam. The robots are listening. The robots are listening. All right, and welcome to another episode of the Autoconverse podcast, where we explore people, ideas, and technologies that influence how we are connected and the way we get around. I am Ryan Girardi. It's great, as always, to be here with you. 
Now, in addition to a lack of media integrity that we see in the world today, we also seem to be living in a real-time nightmare called George Orwell's 1984, where Big Brother convinces Winston that 2 plus 2 equals 5. Here is a peek at comedian J.P. Sears' take on what we are experiencing. Have you noticed how 1984 is playing out in real life? <laughs> it's a horror film. Now at the end of this video, I'll share with you my perspective on what you can do to help make 1984 fiction again, because it makes a much better story than it does a reality. But. In order to do that, it's helpful to recognize how 1984 is playing out in our world today. It's been said that you can't get out of a jail you don't know you're in. But once you know you're in a jail, you can recognize it, and then you can do something to get out of it. And in this case, it's more like you can't get out of Orwell's 1984 horror film until you know you're in it. So let's take a look at how we're in it so we can get out of it. Now that clip comes from one of JP's recent videos. It's about 12 minutes long. I'll put a link to it in the show notes for you to view. Uh, JP's doing a lot for this country. He's really standing up for the folks and uh, going also after the media, which as I've just explained, people have lost trust in. But rather than go down that road, how about we get into some headlines? Airline sales soar along with chaos. Air passengers may have heard of Armageddon, a reference to lost luggage at understaffed airports amid resurgent travel demand. But while the shortage of personnel and high fuel costs present challenges to airlines, they're still turning a profit. American Airlines, Alaska Air Group, and United have all reported their highest second quarter sales ever. The only other risk facing these companies now is scheduling too many flights for their operations to keep up with. In response, Pete Buttigieg, our transportation secretary, has launched a $1 billion first-of-its-kind pilot program aimed at helping reconnect cities and neighborhoods racially segregated or divided by road projects, pledging wide-ranging help to dozens of communities despite the program's limited dollars. Under the Reconnecting Communities program, cities and states can now apply for the federal aid over five years to rectify harm caused by roadways that were built primarily through lower-income black communities after the 1950s creation of the interstate highway system. New projects could include rapid bus transit lines to link disadvantaged neighborhoods to jobs, caps built on top of highways featuring green spaces, bike lanes, and pedestrian walkways to allow for safe crossings over the roadways, repurposing former rail lines, and partial removal of highways. Virgin Galactic has postponed its first commercial flights into next year. Shares of Virgin Galactic Holdings dropped after the space tourism company reported narrower quarterly losses and also postponed its first commercial flights to next year, saying it continues to battle escalating supply chain and labor constraints. Virgin Galactic in February started selling space flight tickets to the general public, saying then it expected to have its first 1,000 customers on board at the start of commercial service later this year. Flight reservations cost $450,000 with an initial deposit of $150,000 and a final payment before the flight. Virgin landed on that price in August, and before the February announcement, the reservations were limited to what the company called a significant list of early hand raisers. In Venice, Italy plans to start weeding out cheap tourists. On a recent afternoon in Venice, a visiting family was given a fine for having a picnic in one of the city's historic areas. The fine was a result of the city's initiative to shift the city's tourism industry to quality over quantity. The city has determined that when more than 30,000 people show up for a day of taking selfies at the Rialto Bridge, squeezing through St. Mark's Square and shuffling past the Doge's Palace, they do more harm than good. And to weed out cheap steaks, the city plans to charge day trippers a fee of 3 to 10 euros, which right now is about 3 to 10 dollars, because for the first time ever, the euro has dropped in value to match that of the US dollar. While officials are still determining final details, including how to charge and enforce the fees, 
The target encompasses hot spots along the Grand Central as well as peripheral islands. And Starbucks plans to close 16 more stores citing personal safety concerns. The stores are in Seattle, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and Portland, Oregon. They'll be closed by the end of July, and the decision comes as Starbucks works to change the company culture under interim CEO Howard Schultz, and as employees across the country vote to unionize. And in cases where it is not able to create a safe environment in the stores, Starbucks will close the store permanently. In those instances, the company will move employees to neighboring stores. Amazon Prime members are accustomed to getting fast, free delivery on things they want the most. And now, Prime members in the United States can enjoy the same perks from their favorite restaurants with a free one-year Grubhub Plus membership trial, meaning they get access to unlimited zero-dollar delivery fees for hundreds of thousands of restaurants on Grubhub. I've never actually used Grubhub. I tend to like to get into my car and go to the restaurant to get the food, but that's just me. Meanwhile, Japan will begin locking up people for online comments. Posting online insults will be punishable by, by up to one year in prison. The new law was passed earlier this summer. Individuals guilty of internet insults may be fined up to 300,000 yen. It's about $2,200. Previously, the penalty consisted of less than 30 days in prison and a maximum fine of 10,000 yen, or about $75. However, there are no clear criteria of what constitutes an insult. In contrast to defamation, which is defined as demeaning someone while referring to a specific fact about them, the law defines insult as demeaning someone without specific fact about them. In automotive news, automakers are beginning to drop AM radio from new cars. Some car makers say they will not include AM radios on future EVs. Now, according to a 2018 Edison Research study, most radio listeners tune in to AM radio while in their cars, making radio broadcasters rely heavily on commuters and travelers. Already, EVs from Audi, BMW, Porsche, Tesla, and Volvo are sold without AM radios, and it's been that way for years. BMW launched its first EVs, the i3 and i8, without AM receivers. Tesla originally included AM radio in the Model S, but phased out the functionality across its lineup in 2018. Even some hybrids are abandoning the technology too, as in the case of Volvo's T8, a PHEV. Although it's not a change the industry has made unilaterally. BMW's hybrids, for example, will not ditch the AM receiver. Coming up. The question for me is, how serious is Elon Musk about that narrative? Is he really for free speech? Or is there something else driving him toward wanting to own Twitter? If you are not familiar with the Velcro and Teflon effect, I'm here to break it down with you for a few minutes. Okay. Velcro does what? Velcro sticks together, right? You get Velcro pieces and stick it on fabric or whatever. It sticks, it sticks, it sticks. And then you got Teflon, slides off. It just seems that negative things stick together, stick in our minds and our hearts, doesn't it though? And all of a sudden it sticks and then another thing sticks. Another thing, next thing you know it, I'm not in a good place. You're not in a good place. That's, that's the Velcro. And doesn't it seem like sometimes we could like, I don't know, someone encourage us, someone give us a compliment and, and, and it's not long, like it doesn't stick too much. It can just slide right off like Teflon and be replaced with something negative that sticks to us like Velcro. The back in the day, human beings, you know, there's something called survival mode. And let's say oh, years and years ago, when our life depended on certain things, okay, we get a negative thought or a fearful thought and it would actually keep us alive. Now, this is back in the day. We, we go, these negative things can actually cause us to go into survival mode. They can actually save our life. But see, how many of us have people chasing us down for our life today, day in and day out? We don't. We don't. We are not meant to just survive. 
we're a chemicals released in our body to keep us alive. We are actually meant to thrive. So in a sense, we want to take the negative Velcro, right? That's there meant there for a survival mechanism. And we want to help retrain our brains to think more positively. That was Inside Out Leadership mentor Rob Holman during the Wellness Mindset segment of B2B Hour on Auto Conversion. Rob is an internationally recognized leadership expert, executive coach, podcast host, keynote speaker, and best selling author. He has a heart for authentic relationships and a true talent for equipping people with the skills and knowledge necessary for their success. Visit Rob on the web by going to www.robholman.com. That's R O B B H O L M A N.com. A few final bits here for you today, one being my conversation with Alan Taylor about the role that Twitter plays in the media and Elon Musk's interest in acquiring Twitter. Taylor was featured on last week's episode talking with me about how cryptocurrency is changing social media, but I left out the segment where he and I were talking about Twitter and Musk's interest in acquiring it, which I will play for you in a moment. And then after that, you will hear our panel discussion that we had, which included Scott Cunningham a cryptocurrency enthusiast and consultant. Scott is the host of Crypto and Things on YouTube and a huge social blockchain enthusiast using what he believes to be the next level of social communication. But before that, let's talk about this recession a little bit. The information I'm about to share with you comes from Morning Brew, the free business newsletter landing in your inbox every morning. Get the daily email that makes reading the news actually enjoyable and support this podcast by using our referral link in the show notes or simply go to autoconverse.com forward slash brew, B-R-E-U. Stay informed and entertained for free with Morning Brew. So are we in a recession? Well, the U.S. economy has shrunk at an annualized pace of 0.9% in the second quarter, and this is according to government data released just yesterday. Now pair this with the 1.6% drop in Q1, the economy is now contracted for two straight quarters. Now, most would argue that traditionally this is defined as recession. Two straight quarters of declining GDP has been frequently used as a rule of thumb to describe a recessionary economy. The economy is supposed to grow, after all, and when it spends half the year shrinking, it is a likely sign of a prolonged slump. But the folks who actually make the official decision on recessions, the National Bureau of Economic Research, do not use the two-quarter rule as the definition. Instead, they follow a more, if it looks like a recession, swims like a recession, quacks like a recession, it probably is a recession. For its official definition, the NBER considers a recession a significant decline, that's in quotes, in economic activity. Not only that, the decline has got to be deep. It's got to be broad, and it's got to last for more than a few months. So when deciding whether the economy is in a recession, the NBER looks to a variety of indicators, not just GDP, to understand the health of the economy. Things such as job growth, consumer spending, industrial production. It's not really just a simple, transparent formula, for better or for worse. And right now, these indicators are flashing mixed signals. Inflation and the Fed's rate hikes to tame it have basically halted all forward economic momentum. Personal consumption, which accounts for the majority of the economy, grew at a measly 1% pace in Q2. And the once booming housing market has also entered a downturn. On the other hand, the jobs picture remains strong with unemployment holding at a low 3.6% rate for the past four months. Now, just this week, on Wednesday, Fed Chair Jerome Powell cited the fact that the economy added 2.7 million jobs in the first half of the year to explain why he doesn't consider the U.S. economy to be in a recession. So what's the bottom line? Well, Americans facing soaring prices for food, fuel, and housing probably do not need an elite group of economists to tell them that the vibes are bad right now. So whether we are technically in a recession or not, Americans say that the economy is their overwhelming concern this summer, and this is according to a Monmouth poll. Again, this was 
brought to you by Morning Brew, which you can get for free and support this podcast by going to autoconverse.com forward slash brew and signing up for free. All right, let's take a quick commercial break and then we'll get into my brief conversation with Alan about Musk's purchase of Twitter and then our panel discussion where we get into how regulations affecting cryptocurrency. We're going to get into the role, the future role of NFTs with Scott Cunningham and Alan Taylor. Hey, Dad, are you still looking for a car? Did you know that when you click on car ads, dealers pay for every click? But shouldn't you get paid? After all, you're the one clicking. That's why I use Ask Auto. With Ask Auto, you build rewards as you shop. Plus, Ask Auto recommends exclusive offers based on your needs. You can ask questions on cars you like and still protect your personal information. You can even set your price. Who knew car shopping could be so easy and rewarding? Ask Auto, fast, fun, and rewarding car shopping. Usually, when someone becomes um, famous or influential in some way, they pivot from being single-mindedly focused on whatever they, uh, whatever uh, train got them there, uh, and they want to diversify. And usually, that means buying up media companies. And we've seen that over and over and over again. Rupert Murdoch, a few years back, <laughs> became the laughing stock when he bought MySpace. <laughs> and just after MySpace tumbled, you know, I mean, <laughs> Facebook came along, right? So, uh, but he was diversified. He was already, uh, uh, you know, a big personality in the media uh, with, with his ownership of, you know, uh, some of the other media companies. But he moved into new media and got into MySpace. And then, as you mentioned, Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, he bought uh, a, a newspaper. And so this is a uh, very common. Uh, so there could be other reasons that, uh, that he wants to buy and own Twitter. You know, that's a good point about Murdoch buying MySpace. I just did a quick search, bought it in 2005 for $580 million. And then sold it uh, a few years later for much less. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Uh, bought MySpace in 2006, signed a $900 million deal to sell ads. Oh, Google signed a 90, $900 million to sell ads on MySpace. By 2007, it had 300 million users and was being valued at $12 billion before it went downhill. So even though that was, what, 15 years ago, you know, what, what what was that price on there? It was three hundred five hundred eighty million versus forty four billion dollars. Yeah, <laughs> wow, that's just wild. Um, yeah, there's there's definitely multiple, I think, motivations here. I mean, Musk says it's not about you know making money. That's nonsense. You have to. He's got to make money with it. Um, he's got to have a business model. Uh, I listened to an interview today where uh, the commentator was talking about the idea of, of more private digital social media, which are things like you see through Discord, uh, Telegram. You know, I use, I use Slack for, for auto conversion and for the podcast. And, and as you know, allow premium members access to the Slack. And it's funny because I see tremendous value there for smaller groups of people you know, whether it's hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands to have a more of a private space. To me, the public space, uh, you know, the public space is necessary, but it, in which is, I would say was, would be Twitter. Um, I cannot imagine that Twitter, the public aspect of Twitter ever go, ever going away. No, uh, I can't imagine it. To me, that's the heart and soul of what Twitter is. Yeah. No, I, I, I think there, uh, there's room for both public spaces and private spaces. And typically, if you're trying to build a, a company, if you're selling a product, you're selling a service, and you want to move people into your funnel, your sales funnel, make them customers, then you want to take a public conversation private, whether that's phone, Slack, Discord, you know, Twitter DM, whatever the case, you want to move them into a private space where you can get them alone and talk to them about your product or service. And so that's a natural progression. 
Scott, hey, great to be on the air with you. Uh, you're clearly a video pro uh, based <laughs> on your YouTube channel, based on your background, uh, and uh, obviously a crypto enthusiast. So it was a, a pleasure to hear a little bit of your story. What I was hoping to do with you guys on the air, I wanted to start with regulation, legislation. So there is a bipartisan bill that's being pushed through Congress. I don't know much about it. It's called the Responsible Financial Innovation Act. It proposes legal definitions of digital assets and virtual currencies. It would, re would require the IRS to adopt guidance on merchant acceptance of digital assets, including charitable contributions. It would make a distinction between digital assets that are commodities or securities. So first of all, I don't know if you know much about this bill, but I'm sure you have some input or at least an opinion about the idea of oversight legislation in the crypto universe. What are your, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I don't know a ton about this bill, but I can definitely say um, what I was mentioning earlier is I don't think uh, regulation of centralized stable coins would be so bad um, just because, I mean, they're already 100% centralized. So why not? Uh, at least hold them more accountable. But in terms of like the decentralized side of crypto, uh, this is always generally a bad thing. And um, I feel like this is probably paving the way for CBDCs, um, like for banks to actually come out with their own cryptocurrencies. There's actually uh, one here in Canada. Um, I believe it's, um, uh, it starts with a V. I forget the name, but there is one bank that is currently uh, coming out with its own stablecoin here in Canada. So I, I think slowly but surely we're going to see actual central banks coming out with their currencies. And I think it'll be very, very interesting to see how it plays out because, you know, it could be very bad for crypto or it could massively increase liquidity and everything will go way, way up. But um, I'd be very inter interested to see how that all plays out. I but I'm very, very skeptical of any kind of legislation or, you know, what they're pro I haven't really looked into this, so I, I can't really speak a lot on it, but I can assume that it's probably not going to be uh, very ideal for crypto. I mean, generally, they don't know a lot about crypto. So when they try to regulate it, um, you know, typically there'll be, you know, little things here and there that uh, that might slip through that, you know, are going to massively negatively impact the space. Alan, before I kind of segue into a, 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 a follow-up question, do, what's what's your sentiment on specifically, you know, the idea of legislation and regulation in on crypto? Yeah, I agree with Scott on on the centralized uh, stablecoin thing. I, I, I think uh, regulating those would be probably a good idea. And but how do you regulate something that is decentralized? you know, like Bitcoin, um, yeah. you know, both the SEC chair and the CFTC chair agree that Bitcoin is a commodity. Uh, so one of the things that this legislation is trying to do is to define uh, the cryptocurrencies that are securities and those that are more like commodities. And I think that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, and, and I do think that, you know, let's face it, there's a lot of a lot of scams in crypto right now. Scams have increased. There have always been scams, but they have increased dramatically in the last couple of years. And I think it's inevitable that regulation is on the way. So just whether or not it's going to be useful regulation, helpful regulation, that's the big question. Um, and I would much rather see legislation you know, from the legislative branch <laughs> to address that, then I would just some agency uh, in the executive branch assume that we're going to regulate it this way. Yeah, it's the idea of regulation isn't very black and white uh, be, because of the nature of blockchain. Scott, you made a comment that everything is really centralized and I help me understand like an exchange like coinbase for example crypto the big exchanges 
those are centralized businesses. Clearly, they can do whatever they want. There's already mm -hmm. reports of some, uh, whether exchanges or marketplaces that are, you know, turning off the ability to cash out. <laughs> you know, yeah. a lot in Celsius. So that centralization. Is there really, is 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 the idea of decentralization, decentralization, is it even real? Is it even possible? Can something be 100% decentralized and not manipulated by anyone? Oh, that's hard to say because, I mean, even like Uniswap um, removed a lot of their crypto stocks, like the stock to um, tickers that were tied to a stock because... I don't know, like there was all this uh, stuff from the SEC and uh, and Uniswap and they went and removed all of their because um, like, it was supposed to be a decentralized protocol for a swap exchange on Ethereum, but they removed all of their um, all their stock related tickers. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say what is truly, truly decentralized, um, but you can definitely assume that all centralized exchanges like any exchange that asks you for like your id to sign up um those are all you know very centralized and um you know if the government demands that they have to you know uh give up information or do something they absolutely will uh like we saw here in canada when uh many exchanges froze people's accounts or blacklisted their bitcoin um when we had the emergency act um, back when the, uh, I believe that was in February. The, freedom so, con the trucker convoys. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it, it shows that it's, there's a lot of centralized points of, uh, failure, but it also shows the need for decentralization. If you just had your crypto in your own wallet, um, you wouldn't have had any of these problems. Same like what happened with Celsius, anyone who had their money in Celsius recently, uh, the massive lending platform, uh, they're going insolvent, so they turned off withdrawals. And uh, pretty much everyone, you know, got screwed there as well. So, you know, centralized things can be good in that they might be more regulated or they can help you recover your password if you forget it or something. But there's much more risk to doing that because they could get hacked. Um, they have to comply if the government, you know, demands them to do something. Uh, if they go insolvent, you lose all your money. I had a million Dogecoin on Cryptopia in 2017 and uh, Cryptopia went down and then uh, I lost that. And then eventually Dogecoin went up to like 90 something cents Canadian. So I could have made like $100,000 off of that. Yeah. Um, but uh, all of that got lost when uh, Cryptopia went insolvent as well. So that was a hard lesson learned for me. But uh, you know, I don't want other people to go through that same experience. So I'm always making videos telling people, you know, don't leave your crypto on exchanges. Uh, don't use any kind of platform or service that requires you to deposit your crypto, maybe through a smart contract in DeFi, you could do some sort of lending. But a lot of the times, the best thing that you can do is just hold on to your crypto. And uh, if you know, it's a good crypto that's going to last through the bear market, uh, that would be what I would do. Uh, not that this is financial advice, of course. But you're suggesting not holding it in a custodial wallet, right? Yeah, exactly. Because uh, it's not insured. Uh, if they go bankrupt, you're going to lose all your money. If you know the government does something, you could lose your money. There's so many risks. Uh, the only real risk of holding it yourself is if you somehow lose access like, or you lose your password or your seed phrase. Um, so there's a little bit more responsibility on you if yeah. you're holding it yourself, but, uh, there's so many more risks that you're exposed to if you're holding it anywhere else, pretty much. Yeah. You guys, what do you think keeps governments from just making crypto illegal? Is it because that would create too much backlash? Cause think about it. If they, if, if a law was passed, it made it illegal like guns, right? Guns are regulated. Okay. There's a black market for guns. So if crypto, if it was illegal to buy, sell and trade crypto, just at the very tip, you know, that would deter a lot of law abiding citizens from participating. Don't you think? Yeah. If uh, yeah. crypto was outlawed, only outlaws would have crypto. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder what keeps governments from doing that. Seems I like would say. Game. 
Yeah, I would say, I mean, because like um, Ripple even said, if they lose their SEC case, they're just going to move to a different country. So I would say a lot of that is not wanting to stifle innovation and, and, and send everything to other countries because there's so many countries that are uh, adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. Yeah. And it's like they could just go there then if you want to make... Uh, these other countries and and they're trying to uh, advertise themselves as like hubs for cryptocurrency like if you're into cryptocurrency come here uh germany just passed a law saying that if you hold your crypto for at least one year then you don't have to pay capital gains so uh, it'll still be going after day traders but not hodlers um and just more and more countries are adopting policies that are pro crypto in a way that if the US or, you know, some big superpower decided to go against crypto, they would send a lot of people to these other places. And I don't think they want to miss out on all of that potential profit and technological innovation in the future. Because um, a lot of these companies and, you know, projects have even said, yeah, we'll just go somewhere else if we really have to. And uh, the US has already made it pretty hard with like certain uh uh, like ICOs and things like that over the past few years as well. Now you've hit the nail on the head. And what that, what that demonstrates is the viability of cryptocurrency. Uh, Alan, you write an incredible amount of, you know, I think what I would classify as current events. Um, what's significant to you? I've got your list here in front of me. Jump in here. I'm curious what's, What's most important? What's top of mind for you right now? Yeah, I think this is very significant um, with, uh, you know, Bitcoin being declared a commodity by both the SEC chair and the CFTC chair. Uh, one of the things that, that's plagued um, legislators and regulators in the U.S. for really the last five years is just getting their minds wrapped around cryptocurrency as a whole so that they can understand it better and know how to regulate it. I think we'd have had regulation a lot sooner if there were some clear cut lines that they could go on to say, well, this clearly is a security and this clearly is a commodity, but those lines don't exist. And that's why the Ripple case is so very important because, you know, Ripple is saying that, you know, Brad Garlinghouse, his argument all along has been, look, if Ripple Labs goes away, if Ripple Labs just disappeared altogether, XRP would continue to operate. And that's because it's decentralized. You know, and well, how do you regulate that? You know, it, it, is it a security? Uh, and his argument has been, well, um, the price of XRP is not dependent upon Ripple Labs. Therefore, it fails the Howey test. But there are some gray areas there because <laughs> they do control a little bit uh, how much XRP enters into the ecosystem. They have some in escrow and they run validator nodes on the, so they are involved in the ecosystem by owning validator nodes. So then is XRP dependent upon Ripple Labs because they're involved in that? So those are those are some very key questions. And I think uh, how that case comes out, what the end result is, is going to determine a lot of things. All right, that is a wrap. Thanks again for tuning in. Be sure to text the keyword AUTOCONVERSE to 855-766-7585. We will send you a link to get subscribed to our YouTube channel so you can tune into the live shows. That's where most of these clips that you hear are coming from. We'll also send you a link to view all of the sponsor and affiliate links that you hear in our podcast, which makes it easier for you to explore the exclusive opportunities that we share with you during each episode. And if you are a Doge holder, well, to the moon. It looks like we may have hit rock bottom in the crypto markets, so I see no better time than right now to start reinvesting, especially in Dogecoin, if that's your thing. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next week.
This is Audiburst Media.